Hey guys, Mike here. So man, did you see the huge moves some of these stocks made? It was like it was 2020 after earnings. I couldn't believe it. Some up 20, 30 percent today. We're going to get into that. I got that video I told you about. We're talking about employment because that is a big X factor here. And hopefully I corrected myself in yesterday's video talking about people retiring earlier than 65, okay, which is a big problem if you saw my video before, but it explains a lot, right? And then we're going to get into the charts and then the earnings coming out tomorrow because you probably might see some more big moves on top of that. But just look at this, guys. Oh, my goodness. I haven't seen moves like this in forever. Remember, these stocks have already moved up massively before earnings. Look at this. Roblox. This is at lunchtime, okay? I wanted you to see this because the market wasn't doing anything. Roblox at 26%, Trade Desk 28%, Airbnb 12.5%, Upstart 22.6%, with again, the market doing basically nothing at this point in time. Then look at a firm who reported earnings a little uh, a couple of days ago, got destroyed 22% because the earnings were horrible. They go up double digits today. Double digits. That's the kind of market we're in right now. Look at this right here. I mean, you know, I guess the, the bears is kind of like, oh, well, see you later. And obviously people got caught in shorts, but then here's the end of this, it's like five minutes till a close. Look at this. Roblox goes up more, 26%. Trade desk breaks, I think it was like 32 at the end of the day. Airbnb almost 14, upstart 28. And then the index is finally wake up, but look at the dollar and the 10 year yield. Look at that. So it did it in the face of all of that, right? Now look at the charts. The only thing I'm gonna say about SPY right here is that it basically is just sitting here at this fork in the road right and you can see whether it goes left or right it's the same gonna be the same percentage move right if we go up to 4300 it's a whopping 4.66 percent we go down it's like almost a little less than five i believe right so let me know in the comments which way you think we're going and that's about all it did it traded in a very tight range then the cues actually it did break out uh that triangle right there it came out it bounced it retested boom and then shot up and looking about 40870 really to be the next mark to break above. If it breaks above that, and that was that high right there, then you know you're looking easily 49, 14, 411 uh, to keep going. But that's what we need to look for now. And when it comes to these tech stocks, I just think of this movie scene right here for now. Remember, no one, and I mean no one, comes into our house and pushes us around. And when I think of these tech stocks, that's what I think of. Like they're just like, whatever. I don't care if yields are going up and everything else. I'm gonna touch on that in just a minute. But you know, like whatever, strong dollar, you know, everything else economically doesn't matter. And with the surprising part about that big move, and by the way, I always say congratulations uh if you bought those stocks or into them, whatever, you know, uh, is the fact that they'd already had a big move up, right? And then we see these earnings, and I read the earnings, you know, and they were some of them were okay, some of them were kind of like, whoa, really? But you would have thought they hung the moon with these earnings. And only thing I can really think with those bigger moves, 30% one day, all of them 25, besides the Airbnb, which is uh, a much, uh, much larger market cap, but still a big move for it, was that people were just loading up on shorts or whatever. And they just thought, okay. And I know one thing that happened today is I saw people in discords and uh, on Twitter and stuff, they were loading up on puts. They're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to ride this down today. Because normally you get that big gap up you'll see it sell off and they just kept going and kept and just kept melting up the whole day so those people especially those odte uh you know puts got ate up you know and and through the i hope they threw the flag in earlier and didn't just keep holding but as i told the members make sure you mark those gaps because remember 90 percent of gaps fill eventually and those are huge gaps right and so again as I said yesterday if rates keep going up and they hold them for a long period of time the, ro the roosters will come home to roost it will happen it's always happened Throughout the history, it will happen, okay? And so those gaps will probably fill. We'll have to see and stuff. And speaking of the yields, this is what I was talking about. Yeah, the 10-year yields have been on a tear, right, since uh, beginning of February. So like 14%. And the Qs were kind of respecting it. I mean, they were doing basically just higher lows coming across. And then, you know, around the 12th, they were like, eh, forget about it. We're going to go up, right? And they started setting higher highs again. And so, and the day was... One of those days where they just kind of defy the odds of what's happening because normally when the yields go up, for those who don't know, that affects you know high beta stocks, tech stocks, things like that the most, right? Because they're the ones that have to take on a lot of debt to keep growing so fast. And it's kind of like, but, but the crazy part is, as I mentioned in the Discord last night, TNX retested and held today, which was yesterday, and that's the 10-year Treasury note yield, but so do risk assets, right? And it's going to be interesting to see which one folds first. And I put multiple examples of this what i'm talking about is 
that this can go on for weeks to months where you see yields going up and yet the Qs continue to divide gravity and go up until one finally blinks. And in this case, if obviously the rates keep going up and everything and they hold them for a long period of time, it could be those stocks will have to see. Now, of course, your Apples, your Microsofts, your Google, the ones that have just an abundance of cash, they aren't anywhere near as affected as these kind of companies who are, you know, obviously don't have a fortress for a balance sheet or anything. And they're just trying to grow. So they're sacrificing a lot, taking on a lot of debt, issuing shares, all this good stuff. And so we'll see, you know, gravity always takes hold. No matter how much something runs up, it will come back down. It always does. Never fails 100% of the time. Now, how far something will run up and how long we'll be floating around in space with no gravity, that's a good question. As I showed you right there in the examples, uh, you know, and if you remember, you get to see them, but you know, you'll see it, some of those went on for months, okay, months. And so, you know, getting into Tesla real quick, I want to touch base on this because it was a quiet day for Tesla compared to other days, obviously. But what it ran into was the 200 EMA. As soon as it hit that, it sold off. I think it was sitting around $114 and 40 cents or something like that. And then it bounced off. And then right above that though, is the 200 SMA sitting around 224, which will change of course, because it moves, but around that area. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens tomorrow. And guys, if you get anything out of this, please hit that like button. It really does help the channel. And if you're new here and you like this kind of content, think about hitting the subscribe button. I really appreciate it. And so in the comments, let me know, you know, what you thought about those moves. Did it surprise you at all? The only reason those kind of moves surprised me, two reasons. One, like I said, just because the huge run up already, right? That was shocking. And two, it's not like, you know, the earnings were just like something we've never seen before, right? So that was, and then of course, I guess the third, just watching what yields are doing and what the bond market is trying to tell the stock market, which is, hey, they're going to raise higher than we thought they were going to raise. They're not going to cut as soon as they thought we were going to cut, Right. But the market's just like, whatever, we're, we're doing our own thing and stuff. And what's happening is, if you look at the Dow, you still see money rotating out of the Dow into QQQ stocks, out of S&P into QQQ stocks. And so that's what you're, you're seeing happening, rolling into tech still at, at this point in time, which is kind of interesting. Now that leads me into this short, I've edited this, this whole interview down for you. So you can kind of hear somebody else besides me talk about this. Uh, about the employment issue and stuff and pay close attention to what he says about when people are retiring and especially about women in the workforce. This was a stunner for me. I wish we were we were here to talk about better. I mean, in some ways it is good news, but in yeah. other ways it's not. You know, and your point about how this is a structural problem means that should the Fed even be hiking rates to try to fix the labor market? I think there are a couple points here. One is the Fed uh, uses their interest rates as a blunt instrument to slow cyclical things like housing. But if you think back, if you think today the Fed has raised rates to almost 5% and the unemployment rate has gone down. It's crazy. <laughs> so what's happening there? So what we see in the U.S. is lower participation, a lot of people 55 and older exiting the workforce, um, and ultimately slower immigration. But it's not just a U.S. phenomenon. I mean, this is happening in Europe. China's population is contracting in Japan. They've done a lot in terms of bringing females into the workforce. But overall, it's like we're hitting a wall a bit on the, the, the demographic story. And that's been exacerbated by COVID um, and what happened there. Kind of brought it forward, maybe. And if that's the case, you would never say, well, the central bank should try to fix that, right? I mean, all of this, would argue, and the things you talk about, <laughs> so all of us from personal experience, the need for child care, the need to help with um, care for older people that right. people might be leaving the workforce to take care of their parents, for instance, those are big structural problems that require like a lot of private and public resources to fix. So it doesn't seem like to me that that would involve the central bank at all. Well, I think there's there's monetary policy. And ultimately what that means is we're going to have a higher resting heart rate for where um, where short rates are. And I think, think? I think so, because I think they're going to have to, even though they can slow the goods part of the economy, which is happening right now, it's harder to do services. The single biggest input in services is, is labor. And I had to bring this out. Like, am I the only one shocked by this? The U.S., which, you know, what, the third largest populated country on the earth or whatever, 700,000 women added the labor force since 2010 in Japan, 2.6 million. And then Europe had three times as many as we did. I mean, that am I the only one? Please put in the comments if I'm the only one that's shocked by that. What if someone like me came and said, you know what, I think we're just a couple months away from a big downturn, Henry, and this labor market is going to look very different. I mean, is that still a possibility I, I, here? I think the data is bearing out, and you're seeing this in the government data, is that employers are not going to shed employees the way they did in the past. The time that it takes to get a worker, particularly in the services industry, is a lot longer. And so what you're seeing is less attrition. And so the whole thing about women in the workforce, that's just another thing right and the whole thing about people retiring not at 65 67 at 55 right it just adds on if you saw my video where i talked about how you got the working age population in this country 
you know, was going like this. Then it plateaued starting in like 2010, 2012, and then started to shrink down in 2018, 19, even before the pandemic. Right. And so that's that's the group we need to grow. You need that to be robust. Because that's the people who spend the most money. They keep your economy propped up. Once, you know, obviously pre-18, you ain't doing nothing but draining stuff out of the system. And then once you're retired, because you already put as much money in the system as you need to put, you start drawing more resources out than what you're putting in, right? You're going to Social Security, Medicare, all that good stuff. And you deserve it, by the way. I'm not saying you don't deserve it, because I hope to be there one day, right? And so that's fine. But those aren't the people that's going to help the economy and prop it up. And they're not you know, going out and buying houses and cars and building up families anymore. They're retired. They're trying to downsize, right? You know, and so unlike people who are the working age population just getting started or in the middle with their families and buying the house and the cars, the RVs, the motorcycles, the huge expensive vacation packages, all that good stuff, right? And so, you know, that's, and again, I say we won't feel the real effects of this till probably 10 to 20 years from now, but boy, when we do, you know, it, it's going to it's going to hurt. You know, and, and and again, like he was saying, we're not the only ones feeling this. That's interesting to see. But and I don't have a solution for it, to be honest with you. I can't make people have more kids. I can't people make people not retire and I can't make the government fix the uh, our, our system for immigration. Can't do any of those. So let me know in the comments if you have a solution. That'd be interesting. But that does lead us into small business. Right. This stuff came out today and you can see right here on retail sales. Remember, retail sales were higher than what people thought. And here, here is restaurants. Look at this. That's the biggest pop we've seen in a long time. I mean, a long time. So over 7% pop, right? And sales and stuff. And this is seasonally adjusted, month over month. And, you know, what else we got here? Where, where do you just talk about the biggest input for services is wages, right? And so you got 46% 40, of small businesses giving raises, and right? And then 22% are like, eh, we don't plan on doing it in the future. But again, they're still having to do it to attract people. And not only do that, but to keep people for sure, because there's so many jobs. Like he was saying, people could just leave. They're like, I'm out of here. I'm going to go over here and get paid better. And I've showed you in the past, you actually get more money if you leave the company than when you stay with a company. And we're just trying to get down to that line right there. If you can get down to that, which we're way off from right now, you know, we'll kind of normalize things. And I don't have the answer as far as like raising rates to help bring down the services inflation part of it. Because like I said, this, the prices are still going up. And I mean, we've affected the good services side, right? Like the industrial parts of the country are feeling it. And so when I sit out here, I always anger people when I say, you know, I don't know how you see a recession because everywhere I go is busy, busy, busy. But again, I live in a state where it's a huge tourism state, huge services state, right? We don't really build or make stuff in Florida. But, you know, if you go to another place where they, where they do and it's a lot of factories and there's no kind of any kind of people come there to visit on tourism or anything. And so it's a lot of industrial stuff. They probably feel it a lot more. I mean, that's, that's the truth because the industrial numbers look terrible. And some of them came out today. They still look bad, right? New orders, still got inventories out there and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, that looks bad, right? But again, what are we in, in this economy? 70% services. And that's 70% of our GDP is services. And so, again, I don't think we've, we've never tried to slow down the services side. And so the only way you can do that is if we stop going to restaurants and on vacations and all this other stuff. I mean, but again, everywhere I go, it's busy. Went out to lunch for Valentine's Day yesterday. In the middle of the day, lunch. Packed out. Just packed out. I was like, wow, okay, interesting. And so, like I said, I went to the day before that to go to Walmart in the middle of the day. And it's just packed out. I mean, it's crazy, you know. And so, let me know what it's like in your area. Again, and let me also know down there before you get upset about it, are you in more of an industrialized area or more of a services type area? All right, and let's see if we can kind of say, oh, yeah, there's two different worlds happening right here in the United States, right? And so that leads us into earnings, right? And we've had some explosive ones. And now, you know, there's some more uh, tomorrow, like Datadog, a security company. This one's been on fire. A lot of people like this one. Crocs, I never had the shoes, but a lot of people love the shoes. I always like to hear their earnings. Southwest, I believe that's the airline. So we'll see if we're still traveling. They'll tell us. And they've had a lot of problems, by the way. Uh, DraftKings uh, is a big one, obviously, for retail and gambling. Uh, Plow Materials, Veil, Stems, another one for energy. Redfin, let's hear about the real estate industry because they've actually had some decent numbers, surprisingly, pop up. And you know people are buying now, supposedly. So, uh, And then, of course, here's the economic data. I'm going to try to reel this one off. Ready? Check this out. Core PPI month over month. PPI month over month. 
Philly Fed Manufacturing Index, Unemployment Claims, Building Permits, Housing Starts, Mortgage Delinquencies, Natural Gas Storage, and then we got an FOMC member speaking to boot. And as I get my breath here, that's a lot going on. And so the biggest thing I'm watching for is obviously PPI is going to be the big one, especially the core, right? And so maybe it'll affect markets. We'll see if finally it affects markets on a positive or negative. Uh, and then you're going to have obviously unemployment claims. People are going to be listening to that a lot and say, okay, do we still got this super hot market or is it finally cooling off more? And then the other one really is going to be mortgage delinquency I want to hear about, right? Because we know, I know car delinquencies are up like record highs, but that don't seem to matter. It is, are people delinquent on their mortgages? And if they are, and so how far? Remember, because all these people that bought in, I guess, 2021 and 2022, really, you know, are, are bought in at much higher rates and much higher prices. And so as those prices have gone down, some of those people are underwater now. And so, and plus with the higher rates, I mean, it's a lot. It shows you the difference in what it would have been if you would have bought in, let's say, 2019 or 2020 versus 21, especially 22. And so, you know, big, big difference. And so, you know, we'll have to see on that. But, you know, let me know what you think. Let me know what you're doing. Let me think. Yeah, and tell me, were you surprised when you saw these companies going up by 30% on these earnings? I got to hear it from you. Please let me know. Anyway. Uh, hit the like and subscribe if you got anything out of it. Another busy day tomorrow, and I'll see you then. Yeah.